Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, on what context is taking place this year annual General Assembly of the United Nations, we ask a question to our guest, Steve Elner, Associate Director with Latin American Perspectives and a former professor at the University of Oriente in Venezuela. Steve Elner, a uh, warm welcome to the program. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Steve, how do you see the world reality in which this uh, new General Assembly, the number 74th, is taking place in New York? Well, just to begin with a, a general perspective on things, I think that never in the history of the world, or a few times, let's say, in the history of the world, uh, have you had a situation of such complexity, uh, on a situation of such tension and conflict in different parts of the world and different nations of the world? And it's not only tension between countries that consider themselves adversaries, it's tension among countries that consider themselves allies. For instance, between the United States and Europe, uh, and Europe and uh, the European Union uh, nations and uh, Great Britain. Uh, President Trump has stated uh, on a number of occasions uh, that Europe uh, is uh, uh, worse than China, and China is an adversary of the United States. Europe is supposedly an ally of the United States. He's insulted the heads of states of various European countries. So that kind of situation is quite dis distinct from what existed, for instance, during the Cold War, when you had a polarization and the sides were well-defined, the pro-Soviet side and the pro-U.S. side. Would you say that under President Trump, the world is more peaceful and more safer, or quite the contrary? I would say the contrary. Given the fact that you have a more complex situation, you have greater uncertainties, uh, I would say that the situation is a lot more Is he dangerous. contributing to that uh, insecurity? Certainly, certainly, because uh, he is such a polarizing figure, uh, and he has uh, not respected the autonomy, the sovereignty of different countries throughout the world. You know, I, I think that uh, in you know, 20 or 40 years from now, if an analyst is analyzing what's happening currently in the world. Uh, it's a very confusing situation, but I think that the main uh, point that would be made, the main issue that will be extracted from this confusing situation is that there's a struggle for sovereignty and that the United States is questioning that national sovereignty in various parts of the world. One of the issues here is uh, Iran, and would, did you see any similarities between the situation of Iran and Venezuela? Well, certainly the sanctions are adversely affecting uh, both countries, both economies in a big way. The difference, Jorge, is that in the case of our Iran, the, uh, the agreement uh, under... Uh, the nuclear agreement. The nuclear agreement under Obama um, took in other countries. Europe, for instance, uh, was, were, the different countries were part of that agreement. Obama, this was an initiative that the Democratic Party supported. So that today, with Trump having uh, opposed that agreement during the elections and ripping up that agreement and then imposing sanctions on, on, on Iran, Iran, there is a partisan struggle within the United States. The Democrats are opposed to what, Obama, uh, what uh, Trump is doing, and Europe is as well. Uh, the case of Venezuela is different. The, uh, Obama issued the famous decree declaring that Venezuela was a threat to U.S. national security. And so the Democrats are on board with the measures against Venezuela. Very few uh, Democratic Congress people are speaking out against them. Uh, and the media is not talking about them. So that, on the one hand, people here in the United States are able to read in the media clearly that the sanctions uh, have adversely affected the economy of Iran. In the case of Venezuela, they don't know anything about that. And the media tacitly accepts the narrative that's coming out of Washington and the narrative that's coming out of the Venezuelan opposition, that those sanctions are directed not against the Venezuelan people, but against the people who are getting sanctioned, namely over 100 uh, Chavistas who are, being, who are on that list of people who are sanctioned. They have no right of replica. They have no right to defend themselves in, in court. Uh, they have been arbitrarily placed on this list. But for the people in the United States, those are the culprits and those are the people who are affected by the sanctions. 
And they're not talking about the 40,000 people that the CEPR report says that they have died as a consequence of the sanctions of the U.S. Right. The only thing that they hear here is there are many millions of Venezuelans uh, leaving the country. Right. And CEPR is, is a think tank. They've done, uh, the, it's headed by an economist, Mark Weisbrot, very well respected economist here in Washington. So this is an empirical study. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who's an outstanding economist, one of the outstanding, most outstanding economists here in the United States, uh, has used that uh, figure to demonstrate the harm that has been done. Francisco Rodriguez, who is a member of the opposition, was Henry Falcón's... Falcón, a presidential the, the candidate. presidential candidate in the presidential Maduro. elections last year. But Rodriguez has recognized and has also uh, brought in statistics of his own that demonstrate that the Venezuelan economy, and specifically the oil production, has been affected by those sanctions. In the case of looking in perspective our Latin American region, that uh, there are theories that they say that the, what they call it the pink tide mm -hmm. uh, uh, is their days are gone mm -hmm. and, and neoliberalism is back in the countries. But for example, there are three, three elections in uh, Latin America in next month, yeah. talking Argentina, Bolivia and Uruguay. In the three cases, candidates from the left, progressive candidates are favored in the polls. Yeah. Is the left or the progressive movements back, or it's really the pink tide dead and uh, a ne neoliberalism uh, live, alive and kicking? I, I think there's a lot of evidence that this phenomenon of the pink tide uh, is gonna, uh, has framed issues that are here to stay. So that regardless of what happens in these three elections, and I agree that the elections in Argentina, the polls all indicate that Alberto Fernandez and uh, Cristina Fernandez uh, are going to win. Uh, in the case of Bolivia, even more so uh, with Eva Morales. But uh, going beyond that, the issues that were framed are here to stay. This is on the table. These are the issues that are being debated. Um, and I think the other thing, you mentioned neoliberalism. You know, Argentina was the outstanding example of how neoliberalism had come back in the case of Mauricio Macri. Um, and yet Macri uh, created a, a mess in Argentina. Even his allies in the United States, even financial institutions that supported him, and he received the largest uh, uh, IMF um, no. loan in the history. Um, uh, with all that, uh, he was not able to get inflation under control. It's a big problem. And his uh, policies were a failure from an economic viewpoint. So that I think that what's important is that in Latin America today, you have a situation that's different from a couple years ago. A couple years ago, Venezuela was pretty much isolated in the continent, with just a few exceptions. But the two main countries that were in the Lima group that were opposed to Venezuela were Mexico, which had certain democratic credentials in spite of their flagrant violation of human rights, and Argentina with Macri. Now that situation has changed. Uh, with Macri out of the picture, uh, if the Fernandeses win those elections, and with Lopez Obrador, who's a uh, center leftist or leftist president who firmly opposes the sanctions against Venezuela, um, the countries that are supporting the sanctions, uh, that are carrying the banner of isolating Venezuela in the hemisphere of the world, are countries that are very much discredited. Uh, in terms of the democratic credentials. Do you believe that, for example, of course, what is going to be tried again once more by the U.S. is to trash Venezuela, to trash Cuba, to trash Nicaragua, saying that is the troika of uh, uh, basically uh, dictatorships of ty ty tyranny, yeah. and therefore what they're going to try to is to leave Venezuela out of the United Nations, saying those representatives uh, are not going to have their credentials renewed and therefore doesn't exist anymore. Do you think that are going to succeed or once more that uh, rhetoric in, in the world at the level of the General Assembly is not going to get traction? Well, I think that the, there's one thing that Venezuela has to its advantage and works against Washington and anything it attempts to do against Venezuela, and that is the General Assembly 
is truly a democratic body, unlike the Security Council that should be revamped. Uh, but in the case of the General Assembly, each nation has equal weight. Each nation has one vote. And even though you know, there are 50 nations that recognize Juan Guaido as president of Venezuela, uh, all those countries, I believe, uh, with the exception of the United States, also recognize uh, Maduro as president. But going beyond that, there are over 100 countries that don't recognize uh, Guaido as president. So that any measure along those lines that you mentioned uh, will not be supported by a majority of the nations in the General Assembly. Climate change, a big issue. The week started precisely on Monday, what they call the summit of, uh, about the action against climate change. And we're talking about uh, that, for example, President of uh, Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were really criticized countries like the U.S., like uh, we're talking Japan, we're talking South Africa, and we're talking Australia because their positions in the past. How present or how much awareness is, would you say, that exists around the world about climate change and the urgency to do something that, for example, last year, or what could be achieved in this General Assembly? Well, I think that there is no doubt that just like uh, Trump represents a extreme tendency when it comes to Iran and when it comes to Venezuela, uh, positions that are not supported by many of the U.S. allies, for instance, in Europe, in the case of climate change, the decision of President Trump to withdraw from the protocols of, of Paris um, uh, is not supported by most of the rest of the world. Uh, and that this is really an extreme position. Bolsonaro represents that position. Uh, Trump represents that position. And the extreme right represents that position here in the United States. But it's not a position of the majority of people. The surveys indicate that. And I think that in the discussion in the General Assembly, especially given the fact that there are nations that have, like I said before, the same weight, the same vote that has the United States or Russia or any other country in the world that are being threatened by being wiped out of existence because they're small islands uh, in the Pacific. And uh, to the degree that the ocean level rises, those countries are gonna get wiped out, uh, wiped off the, the, the face of the earth. Um, so those countries are speaking up, and I think that this indicates once again that the United States is isolated uh, in the world. Do you think that the United Nations need to be reformed? Well, I think that the Security Council needs to be reformed. Uh, the Security Council was created uh, 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 at the end of World War II, and it reflected a reality that is no longer the reality of the world today. You have countries that are very, very important from an economic and uh, population viewpoint that outweigh uh, the population of other countries that are not members of the Security Council. So I think that uh, reforms are definitely ne needed. And there's a consensus also in terms of just the number of countries that have a vote in the General Assembly uh, that favor a reform of that system. What would you say about the skeptics or the skeptics that believes that uh, the UN is an instrument of the US? Well, uh, I would say that uh, the United Nations is an extremely important body. Uh, it's a venue for the debate and, and discussion. As I said before, the General Assembly is theoretically the most important body in the United Nations. And so that, that opinion, although I respect it, um, doesn't really uh, reflect the potential of the United Nations, especially given the fact that the five members the five permanent members of the Security Council only represent five votes in the General Assembly. Talking about economy, the perspective for the year 2020 is that there, there's going to be a slowdown in the growth all over the world. We're talking about uh, the U.S. estimate 2% of the, of the growth. Uh, CEPAL, uh, meaning the Latin America, if you want, division of United Nations in the economic terms, is calculating a 1.3 uh, growth for Latin America. Mm 
how will that be the impact in terms of fighting against poverty? That is one of the issues, one of the themes of this General Assembly. Yes, I, I think there's no doubt about it that the economic downturn is going to adversely affect the very poor, the very poor in each one of these countries, uh, and inc including here in the United States. Uh, and there is no question about it that there will be an economic downturn. After all, it's inevitable. In capitalism, from the beginning of capitalism, you have uh, moments of expansion, moments of contraction. And what recent history has demonstrated is that the moments of contraction, uh, because of the inherent contradictions that are not getting resolved uh, by economic policy, uh, that the contraction uh, is more violent and lasts longer than in the past. So that there's no question about it. It might, ha might happen uh, uh, towards the end of this year, it might happen next year. We don't know when it's gonna happen, but there's no question about it, that it's gonna happen because, uh, look, here in the United States, companies have all the possibilities to invest, all the possibilities uh, to increase production. The problem is lack of purchasing power. Uh, the companies have, profits have soared, the rich have gotten richer, there's no question about it, all the empirical studies demonstrate that, and yet, for instance, here in the United States, uh, minimum wage is less than it was back in the 1970s in terms of real purchasing power. So that given that disparity between, and this is a term and a concept that Keynes uh, put forward, the propensity to consume and the propensity to invest, there's a higher propensity to invest there's more investment power and less consumption power. And as a result, I think a recession, a very harsh recession, is, is pretty much inevitable. An area that we didn't discuss is Middle East, and it's that the situation is very tense. We're seeing that the bombing of uh, refineries in <clears throat> Saudi Arabia uh, with President Trump imposing even stricter sanctions against <coughs> Iran, even though <coughs> Iran says that they have nothing to do with that. They deny that, and they say that if eventually the U.S. will attack military, uh, Iran, Iran will respond immediately. And then you have the, the issue of Israel with Benjamin Netanyahu having a very bad election. So how you see the tensions in the Middle East? Well, I think that this is another example of how the United States is somewhat isolated in the world in that look at uh, this recent attack on uh, re uh, oil installations in Saudi Arabia, uh, the United States immediately uh, pointed the finger at Iran, even before Saudi Arabia did. Uh, and Europe uh, is stating, uh, or at least up until recently, has stated that uh, it's unclear where those attacks came from. Um, I think that the commercial media has focused too much on this uh, tension and conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Certainly, it's an important aspect of could the story. Could be a war. And it could result in war. But what they're not focusing on is Yemen. The, the Houthi rebels have been fighting for five years now. Um, Saudi Arabia is intervening with U.S. logistical support, with all kinds of material support, with weapons that are made in the United States. Um, and so, the Houthi weapon, uh, rebels are claiming responsibility for those attacks, and that's where the attention ought to be focused on. And in the case of the mass media in the U.S., we do not hear that angle. Very little. So the whole thing is also we're talking uh, presidential uh, 2020 elections in the U.S. Do we believe that in this uh, session of the General Assembly, uh, Trump is going to try to play his cards in a way that uh, he could reaffirm support for his reelection among the rest of the world? Well, I think that's been his strategy, an important part of his strategy all along. Uh, there's no question that he's uh, playing that card. And the fact that there isn't a real debate about these issues within the Democratic Party and within the United States. I mean, you read the media here in the United States, the newspapers, et cetera, and it's all focused on domestic issues with very, with very little on international issues. And you listen to the Democratic Party debate of the presidential candidates or pre-candidates of the Democratic Party, and there was very little on foreign policy, very little in the way of criticism of Trump in specific terms. Uh, 
in general terms, yes, but not you know, dealing with specific issues. So I think that works in Trump's favor. There's no question about it. Uh, the analysis of Alex Main about uh, Latin America, he's an international expert, is Donald Trump doesn't give a damn for Latin America. The only thing that he gives a damn is for himself and for his reelection. And therefore, that uh, iron fist, again, the, what they call Bolton, the troika of the tyranny, is the only purpose is to gain, to win the state of Florida. And in order to do that, that is a swing state, in order to do that, he is aiming for the vote of the Cubans and the Venezuelans in exile. And therefore, the rhetoric is to satisfy them with the hard line. And therefore, in reality, whatever happens in those three countries, he personally, he doesn't give a damn. The only thing that he wants is the vote. Do you agree? Well, I think there's no question about it. If you look at uh, his policy, for instance, towards Saudi Arabia, his support for Saudi Arabia, which is anything but a democratic nation. When he talks about tyranny, when he talks about dictatorship, when he calls Maduro a dictator, even though there are elections that are held in Venezuela, um, what about Saudi Arabia? I mean, it's such an obvious contradiction. Uh, with this recent attack on uh, oil installations in Saudi Arabia, uh, Trump uh, uh, made the statement that the United States will wait to see what Saudi Arabia's response will be. In other words, our response will depend on Saudi Arabia. That has been criticized here in the United States because, in a sense, it's a violation of U.S. national sovereignty, saying that uh, Saudi Arabia has the final say on such an important issue. But in addition to that, you mentioned Florida. I think it goes beyond Florida. If it was, you know, it, I personally don't believe that Trump is going to win the elections in 2020. Um, be, no, not, not so much because of Florida, because of other key states. There are five key states. And the other key states, such as Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Indiana, those states, the de all the Democratic Party pre-candidates, according to the public opinion polls, uh, are beating him badly. Like uh, 8 to 10 percent above um, Trump's... Trump. Uh, so that I, I don't think that he's going to win the elections, but I think that his strategy is not only to assure that uh, Florida goes Republican, but also that by such, using such a, a hawkish um, narrative that he will have the advantage over the Democrats, who I mentioned before, are reluctant to criticize Trump on these foreign policy issues. They hit hard on domestic issues, health, education, etc but not in foreign policy. And Trump is uh, playing on that, is relying on that uh, in order to sound more hawkish and in a demagogic fashion appeal to people throughout the country, not just Florida. Steve Wilner, thanks very much for joining us. Good.